Peter Joseph is the founder of the Zeitgeist Movement, a grassroots worldwide organization that advocates an alternative economic system based on sustainability, cooperation, and human need. His most recent book, The New Human Rights Movement, delivers a startling expose about the violent oppression that defines our economic order, while issuing an urgent call for global activism to unite to replace it. I sat down with Joseph to talk about the contradictions and crises of capitalism and what he advocates to save the future of the planet from catastrophe. Peter, you have a very interesting background, uh, having worked both in advertising and equity trading. Let's talk about advertising first. What function does this industry serve in today's society? The best way to explain that is to look at the fact that our economy is based on consumption, and advertising is the arm of creating artificial demand. And without that arm, and it's so polluted, as you know, I, mean, I can't even imagine what the world would be like without advertising, but without that arm, you wouldn't have people aspiring to things that are highly irrational, abused by our social inclusion. When advertising presents something to the community that seems to be something that some people want, it spreads like a virus and then everybody wants it because it's an issue of social inclusion, which is a part of our biology because that's how we identify. We identify and define ourselves by how others see us and how we in are included in the group. So it manipulates our most primal sense of humanity in order to sell things. And again, back to my original point, if you didn't have that arm in our consumption-based society since the Industrial Revolution, the economy would collapse. That's a very unique point to make because when you first start an economy of this nature, like in the agrarian society and then in the handicraft industry, you're meeting demand, right? That's the point, and that makes sense. But at some point, this kernel seed had to change because when you have such a highly efficient, productive society that we have now, at least in the technical sense, not in distribution sense because we have poverty and all that, at least in the technical sense of what we can create, the efficiency, abundance, you have to have demand created now. And that's, a, that's basically the, the kernel seed of one of the central flaws of market economics or capitalism that has come to fruition today. Not only destroying human psychology, but destroying the environment simultaneously because you have a, an insatiable culture that's been literally generated. And as I detail in my book in the National Association of Manufacturers, mid 20th century, they were actually arguing that that consumerism was the best defense against communism and totalitarianism. They were, this incredible PR campaign went on for, for a, well, it still goes on, really, but it's echoes of the original intent to transform society into one that just wants to buy and consume. And then progress, of course, being defined by what we produce, more stuff we produce, the more you buy, the more you own, that must be progress now. It's an incredibly disturbing uh, just realization that this does nothing to benefit society. In fact, it's just literally I, created I, to keep society afloat, the it, economy afloat. Yeah, it's a, cult, it's a kind of cultural violence. The more people promote consumeristic values, vain uh, materialistic values, the more they want more and more you know, this and that, the more they flaunt that kind of phenomenon, the more they create what is termed by Johann Goldtong cultural violence. Because if you create a society that thrives in this type of self-identification, you're basically also promoting not only the destruction of the environment, but the dis diminishment of others. Because you're saying that I can afford this, I have the status, and I'm better for that, and this person can't. And we see that you know, phenomenally amplified today in the modern world with the, the winning community and our lovely president and his rhetoric. It also carries over into misogyny and everything else, as I'm sure you know. Fairly recently, uh, he said, well, we, we want to have rich people in charge of the economy because clearly they must be good at it. So then the complete absence of, you know, where's the sympathy? Where is right. the, where's the actual binding uh, uh, purpose of an economy, which is to provide for everyone, ideally? No, so it, the, the sickness has become increasingly more palpable. I often wonder what a world would be like without advertising, which would be a world without marketing and markets. And it can tell you it would be a whole lot different <laughs> and far more peaceful and sustainable and amiable and just uh, humane than what we see today. Mm -hmm. From an insider's perspective, how exactly does the stock market work? Stock market is a proxy system that was developed. Uh, it was contrived out of the original foundation, which were a board of directors for a company. So a bunch of people each have a million dollars. They get together, they invest, say 10 of them, $10 million into a company, and then they get dividends, right? That was the, made basic sense you know, years ago. But someone said, you know what? I want to sell this stock and this guy's gonna buy it from me for a little bit more, I'm gonna make money off of that. And then suddenly the exchange system began. And slowly but surely, the idea of selling artificial shares of nothing effectively became a means of making money. I call it drone warfare economics. 
It's just like people that drive drones, they don't see any kind of humanity as they drop bombs across the world. The people that trade the stock market have no idea what they're doing when they're shorting, say, the currency of some small country, effectively contributing to that country's decline. <clears throat> but back to your question, it started off as an innocuous kind of investment strategy and then it moved into uh, this thing where you have people artificially trading things for no other purpose. 83% of all stocks are owned by 1% of the population. It is one giant money-making machine for the elite. And it dis it, the financialization of it all, because financial services have become so large, and the money, only 5% of uh, US population is in financial services, yet 30% of all GDP is taken by that. And that doesn't even account for all the growth over the years that is attributed that we know to the upper 1%, upper 10%. So this is one of the most powerful political centers now simultaneously, and it's truly despotic that you have effectively the most powerful and profitable system on the planet now, one that creates nothing. It's there to simply make money out of money. Um, so it's a cancerous disease. It's, it's what happens in financially mature nations that have pretty much run out of the, the, the uh, angling required to keep as maximizing profits in a given industry. So instead, they move to financialization and it moves in all sorts of other despotic things like uh, dead peasants insurance. These are companies like Walmart that would take out insurance on their employees and get paid when they die, things like that. So it's just this commodification mm -hmm. of everything, put a dollar sign on it, no relationship to anything anymore, abstraction become reality once again. And high frequency trading is, is almost just done with computer oh, algorithms. Yeah. When I was in trading, uh, it was the start of artificial intelligence and the traders around me were like, oh man, this is, it's over. Once Goldman Sachs gets their supercomputers together, most of these companies when they trade, it's just, just a little detail some will find interesting, the amount of time they're in a trade is pretty much seconds because they're fronting other orders because that's what these companies can do. In other words, they're trading tiny little spreads of pennies but with heavy amounts of shares in front of other orders. And then they use computers to do this and then they can generate literally millions of dollars off of fractions of time spent in and out of the market on a mac giant microprocessing level. Um, anyone that <laughs> thinks today, especially, that Wall Street isn't rigged needs to wake up because there's no way artificial intelligence isn't dominating. It's pretty much all the big bank, investment banks with their artificial, artificial intelligence versus other people's artificial intelligence at this point. Uh, there's, no, uh, there's no rhyme or reason to it when it comes to human perception. So in effect, you have this giant money-making machine that the public has been roped into, such as their retirement and the, you know, all the things, the IRAs that for some reason are now connected to the market. The market is inflationary driven, which gives it its artificial sense of, develop, of uh, progress, meaning the more money that we pump into our society, the more it goes into the market, the more it keeps rising. So yeah, if you put in your retirement into, a, into the stock market, it will probably, probably rise. It'll crash periodically and then people will make a fortune off of that too. So anyway, the whole society has been coerced into this nonsensical participation that effectively holds up the most giant and powerful political subclass, the financial sector. And if anyone wanted to see another level of sanity emerge on this planet uh, in a step-by-step -step process rather than complete structural change, I suggest the abolishment of Wall Street. It is, there's nothing positive about what this institution does. And those that say that it's there to help investment, you can invest in anything with direct money without the need to go IPO. The $700 billion float of Apple has nothing to do with what it actually produces at all. Mm -hmm. It's just what the, the people are trading and buying and moving the stock around. It's just the game. And it's too bad that people are so ignorant about that. Uh, it's a siphoning machine that is taking basically money from the lower class and bringing it to the upper class through different mechanisms. And, and a lot of people who are middle class, lower class, don't invest in Wall Street because it's just completely too abstract for them. But everyone participates in debt-based currency and, and the way that the currency yeah. um, operates. How does it make sense that there is more debt than there is currency? <laughs> Good question. Mainly because of the interest that's charged. Because we, ch in capitalism, every product has to have something that makes money, excuse me, that makes a profit. And then when the sale of money, which is what banks do, they create and sell money effectively. You know, when they lower and raise interest rates, they're, they're changing the price of what it's gonna cost you to get money and a loan. And then they produce interest, obviously, and that interest doesn't exist in the money supply. So you have today about 200 trillion in debt in the world and about 80 trillion in currency. So what does that mean? It means that those that are holding the bag in the lower class are the ones that get screwed when you have economic declines. There are always gonna be bankruptcies and things like that that happen in a kind of classism, the structural classism that I call it, that effectively hurts the lower class. 
And the fact that people don't see that either. I mean, that goes back 5,000 years. It has been in lockstep of something else that we're familiar with called slavery. So debt peonage, slavery, convict leasing. Uh, the, even today in certain areas of Asia, they have debt that's passed through generations from farmer to child, and that child has to continue working off its father's debt in effectively a kind of uh, post-neo-feudalism. So these phenom this phenomenon is there. And it's unfortunate that more people don't see the actual intrinsic, intrinsic problem of debt. And the solution to that, you, can't, you can argue that you could get rid of a debt-based currency and so on. And I've had many conversations with people about that. But the question is, why hasn't it happened? Mm -hmm. Because it's intrinsic to, this, to, the, to the function of capitalism. And it's not even that they act insidiously. It's just what their job is. Their job is to make money out of nothing, sell it to people, and then when the people can't pay it, they take their property. And that property goes, it's just another funneling system. And here's another thing I'll, I'll mention. All the money that's made in the world comes from the lower class taking loans. So right now, less than 63% of Americans have $1,000 in savings. Yet the lower class, that same subclass, is what takes on all the major loans, home loans, car loans. That money comes in, the people buy all this stuff, and then that money that's spent goes basically right back up to the upper class again because we, as we know through the growth of the past 10 years, all of the, the major income has gone to the upper 10, well, five to 10%. So it's even worse now, so you see my point? So we, the people take on all the loans of the entire collective money in society, and then that money is extracted through them through various forms of structural classism and goes right back up to the upper 1%. People should be enraged by that, but they don't see it because it's a structural phenomenon. It's something that's happening under the surface that isn't readily apparent. And that's why, due to ignorance, no one really reacts on it. It seems like no matter who's in the White House, Obama, Hillary, or Trump, Goldman Sachs turns out to be the winner. Uh, and even Trump, you know, based his whole campaign saying, I'm not, I'm not a Goldman Sachs shill, and, and look what his cabinet is stacked with. Yeah. I mean, how powerful is Wall Street in terms of controlling the political s spectrum? It's very covert, but it's definitely an enormous power because the financial sector is like the, pollu the polluting force that underlies everything. And it's very difficult for people to understand that, that you know, the major corporations have to be in bed with these major banks. And due to financialization, they ultimately bleed over into investment banks. So much money is made by major corporations that people don't even know about. It have nothing to do with goods and services. They have to do with this recycling, financialization, and reinvesting, and this and that. There's a whole subclass of all major corporations that reinvest everything that they've done, and they employ Wall Street to do so. Wall Street, as people have talked about since the American Revolution, the banking system has been given this privilege, I'll say it this way, there's a privilege that, that banks, investment banks, commercial banks, and effectively the financialization has had, and it's been unquestioned, and that's basically the control of money and artifacts that relate to money but have no intrinsic value. Again, that's why I advocate the abolition of Wall Street and the entire thing, these derivatives upon derivatives, and so we create this housing bubble, right? So the housing market, abusing of people uh, that are in need and basically triggering the systemic crisis that these people at the top made a fortune off of, but then contributed to public health outcomes such as 500,000 people that were dying of, that died of cancer because they couldn't get treatment. And that's just the tip of the iceberg of the financial uh, relationship to public health. Um, let's talk about empire. Uh, of course, we see U.S. military presence in over 70% of all the nations on Earth. Uh, when you look at military personnel, it's almost every single country. But beyond military hegemony, there's the hegemony of U.S. capital. Of course, this is more hidden. But how does this financialization underpin the empire? Since the fall of the Soviet Union and the development of the World Bank, the World Trade Organization, uh, NATO, underlying all of these, these, these uh, higher structure institutions is neoliberal globalization and financialization. Those three words have to kind of go together because it's one synergy. And since the attempt at a different type of social order has been officially squashed, uh, the World Bank and the IMF have gone out of its way to make sure neoliberal policy is employed everywhere in any country that doesn't have an interest, such as Iran, such as Iraq, such as Syria, such as a long list of countries, such as Libya, that have tried to do something different or have been on the outs for whatever reason, but usually have economic roots that go back in history to some degree. Uh, any country that tries to step out of the way gets, gets hit with the idea that they are 
violating human rights because in this world, at least in the perception of, of democracy that we have, neoliberalism is supposed to be right next to it, the idea of free markets. Of course, it's, it's not really free at all. It's, that's the thing about it. It's not really neoliberalism, neoliberalism because that would mean everything would be open. That's the true idea of neoliberalism, that when they, you know, the people that came up with this word decades ago, they said, well, we need some kind of philosophy to counter communism. We want to promote open free markets across our borders. And of course, no one actually did that. So it's that lure of neoliberal thought, but it's really just a, a function of the wealthy class gets the socialist support as usual, and the lower class countries or individuals are the ones that have to suffer through neoliberal free market outcomes. They're the ones that get to fight and lose. But the upper class states, like the United States and empire, United States empire, it doesn't, it's not susceptible to any of this because it's just, the, it's just the bully in the room, it's the big empire, and it has its vassal states that help, and it has its arm of NATO, and it has its all its World Bank IMF institutions to support its economic worldview, which eventually leads to its territorial and geopolitical control of other nations, because that force won't tolerate anything else. So yeah, it's, it's really insidious, and we've had now an empire that's built really on economic coercion more than anything else. And I mean, the, the military bases are still powerful. They're there, and they're, they're clearly functional. But the economic power yielded in the ideology of neoliberalism has been the true driving force of control. But I would definitely argue that their, their fear of communism mm -hmm. and their fear of losing American, Western, and effectively capitalist hegemony brought in this idea of neoliberalism and the idea that if we don't employ and force this old Adam Smith invisible hand idea across the world, then we're going to lose our seat of control, ultimately. Mm -hmm. Expand more on the notion that all wars are class wars. You can look at society as, as a stratified structure, both in, a domestic, in, in any domestic society, such as the United States, where you, of course, you have the, the rich and the poor and the, the dwindling middle class. Then you can apply that exact same uh, a macro view to the states, the nation states of the world. And they, it's amazing to see how close in resemblance they are. Uh, after World War II, any country that simply wanted to do something different outside of, again, the neoliberal order had to suffer the same fate. So the World Bank, what do they do? They pose austerity. They, they keep those countries poor and destroyed. Mm -hmm. And that's a great way, you know, if, you, if there's no infrastructure in these countries to start to develop new ideas or new patterns, then there's no threat. So. Um, and of course, there's the grudge. There's always going to be an element that's, that is an echo of our economic dominance, U.S. economic dominance, or just you know, this pattern of economic dominance that builds in other forms of bias. And I have no doubt you know, that Western society, with its increasingly jingoistic views and this reversion back into a xenophobic presence, whether it's you know, claiming that Mexicans are stealing their jobs or, or that the, the Arab communities and the Muslim communities are now the hub of this terrorist ideology and so on, uh, these things foment after the fact and create long-term patterns of bias and bigotry. I like that you brought up a macro and micro uh, in terms of the class, classism in America and also the global classism because yeah. people talk about the developed world and the underdeveloped world as if that's just the way it is yeah. instead of the underdeveloped world actually giving way to why we have a developed well, I mean, colonization, world today. Colonization, as you know very well, is effectively a, a sprawling class antagonism. It's a subjugation. You know, the poor of the world are not poor because they've been left behind in, in market capitalism. They're poor because of these years of colonization that have destroyed Africa and areas of Latin America. You call your new book a, a logical train of thought from a social psychology perspective. And let's start with the notion that poverty is violence, right? Go over some of the casualties that arise from the structural violence that exists today in the system. I, the big word I use is socioeconomic inequality, which poverty falls under the umbrella of. Socioeconomic inequality, basically class stratification, has been held up as some kind of innovator force, some force of innovation. Oh, yeah, that's about the only defense of it you'll hear. They'll say, well, you know, you gotta have poor people that aspire to be rich people, and that will create the engine of innovation. More nonsense is produced by industry. That's effectively the only defense I've ever heard of stratification, other than people claiming it's a biological reality and, and there's no other choice than for us to be these primitive primates that stratify, and therefore the bottom, rings, the bottom rungs will suffer. It's not just poverty that's the worst form of violence, as Gandhi stated. To be in a stratified system is against well-being and public health. That's been proven by a lot of different theorists in epidemiology, where they measured all of these artifacts, such as, such as the level of violence. In fact, Dr. James Gilligan, which I know you've interviewed, he's the former head of the study of violence at Harvard, extremely brilliant man who studied this as a prison psychologist, and his, his 
core statement. You want to reduce violence in society, reduce inequality. So there's also the, so, the, the psychosocial stress, that we are killing each other through plaques in our arteries from the release of certain stress hormones that are directly attributed to socioeconomic inequality as well. In other words, the more you're involved in a class-based society, the more you witness the, the haves and the have-nots, the more it messes you up, and there's a, it's biologically uh, associated. So this is an unnatural state. So poverty and socioeconomic inequality kill about 18 million a year, based on one estimate. So that is a couple, couple holocausts in one year. They say the Soviet Union killed 100 million people in one century of its existence. We're killing in capitalist inequality, capitalist generated inequality, that many in six years. So the defense of a class stratified society is, is no longer existent in the public health research. Under, under capitalism, there's always going to be people who are poor, right? Why is this notion that this is just a constant inevitability that we have to accept. Poverty, unemployment in the system, booms and busts. This is the most odd thing to me about capitalism, is the acceptance that these things are natural. First of all, the massive vehicles of class war. Uh, every time there's a bust, it doesn't affect. The wealthy can endure that. So they can, they can find ways to work around it. But that creates cheap labor, boom, better for, better for the owners of the country and the owners of big business and finance. Uh, it, the, they take foreclosures. The financial services sector effectively booms during this because they're the ones that get to grab up everything that lower class can't pay for anymore. And then when the, 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 the boom starts happening again, uh, the QE or all the things that the central banks do uh, invariably go into the powerful corporate and financial sectors because we still have that philosophy of trickle down. We still have the idea that you have to pump money into big business and effectively the stock market in order to generate more activity that will float down to the lower class. So it, yeah, it's really transparent and no, it doesn't have to exist. Let's talk about the inefficiencies of the capitalist model versus the possibilities that exist today with modern technology. Paint a picture juxtaposing this crazy comparison from food to energy. Well, the greatest inefficiency would be the fact that we have poverty at all. So we talk about this advancement of society and this great productivity. The most powerful force, the most positive force we do have of the whole of human civilization is since the Industrial Revolution, we're able, we're able to do more and more and more with less and less and less. And that is the driving force that can create equitable, equitable distribution and peace on this planet. So the fact that you have five people now with more wealth than the bottom half of the world, and you have close to a billion people not getting their nutrition met, and you have what in an, by uh, Peter Edwards of Newcastle University put out what he called the ethical poverty line, which is based on lifespan, not the metrics put out by the UN. And when you use this ethical poverty line, you find that 60% of the world is actually in poverty. That is, is lunacy from an efficiency standpoint. No one can sit there and claim that this is an efficient system when that's the outcome on the social level. Now we can talk about the efficiency of a factory and you know, all the great fruits of technology that people will claim are associated with capitalism, which is nonsense too. It's our, it's our ability to design and, and our ingenuity through science and technology that's created this, not some weird mechanism that's attributed to capitalism. And what about food and waste? Uh, the waste is absolutely insane. You have 40, percent of all food being wasted because of inefficiencies in the distribution pipeline, uh, which is staggering. You know, we have globalization, moving food all around. You have the average American food plate moves about 1,400 miles. Uh, that, there's no reason for any of that, especially now. If you go down the line of what's possible, you remove the, the chaos of human society and its strange beliefs and everything else, and you actually look at what we can do, then there's no reason for anyone to be hungry, obviously. There could be an, an incredible state of efficiency and abundance across food and energy and production. So when we talk about abundance, it's so confused with people because they, you know, I, I get attacked all day long. Like, well, the world is finite. You know, we can't make an abundance. What's, you know, <laughs> and it, what? It, obviously, it's a relative notion. I mean, the, the sun will eventually burn out. It's abundant to us in the long term of time. So you, it's not about you know suddenly there's a magical amount of everything. It's about using the efficiency and of course focusing the economy on the interest to have an abundance because in our current society, it's the antithesis of what's rewarded. We reward scarcity. We want things to be generally scarce. This, the corporate construct does. Business doesn't want there to be an abundance of anything. So the pollution of the water supply, that's great for the water bottling companies. So we're rewarding the exact opposite. So you can't have sustainability, preservation, efficiency in a society that rewards the opposite. And therein lies the great con contradiction of the capitalist system. And in terms of energy, I mean, what is possible right now? I remember reading that 
just such a small area in like Africa could power the entire continent plus part of Europe. I mean, there I, I do an analysis in the book that just looks at it looks at all the basic renewables and each one of them has the capacity to create a global abundance and meet the current needs. And you put them all together in a synergy and then make, make basic what's called mixed use systems. It's a little bit technical, but we don't have any kind of systemic incorporation in our cities, not like they should be. Every single, everything in the house today should have solar panels that not only power the home as much as possible, but they run the energy back out into a central grid. Suddenly everything becomes an attribute of energy development. It's shared. And you do that if someone created a society that there's a few smaller studies in, the cities, cities in Europe that are doing that with outrageous efficiency potential. So when you put all that together, uh, there's, it, it's absurd. It's absurd. You know, everyone in small pockets and these entrepreneurs are doing their best, you know, even uh, like Elon Musk and the battery technology, and they're trying to do something, but there's no concentrated focus. There needs to be a, basically a Manhattan project to figure out what the best solution is globally to unify the synergies of all of our renewables and to make them all work. And if we did that, if we actually got the minds of say all the universities together right now and you had a university project across the entire world and said, we're gonna focus on this problem right now. What is the combination of renewables? How do we distribute it across the world? And how do we make it uh, create a, an abundance at zero cost effectively? And I guarantee if you did that, it would happen probably in six months. The intent of the, bu the business class isn't that they willfully want to repress sustainable, abundant resources and, and products. It's that they know deep down, just like everyone knows about a lot of things in their subconscious, that if they did that, they make themselves obsolete. And no business on this planet is going to try and make itself obsolete, no matter how green it claims to be. But that's what it leads to. If, any, if anyone really wants uh, to improve the ecological state, specifically the type of transformations required, uh, would effectively would, would cut energy in industry back by half at a minimum. There would not be that many people employed, and money would not be made anymore because we have that ability in technology now to create things that last, that will work, that will be modular, updatable, without that need of the servicing and constant uh, over turnover that we see in the current energy uh, industry sector. Really quickly, let's go back to just what's possible. Can you explain the notion of vertical farming? Because I don't yeah. think a lot of people realize what that is and the potentiality. So I did an extrapolation in the book regarding vertical farming based on a study out of Columbia University. And what I've calculated crudely, and I did this deliberately to give, show the extremity of it, if you apply vertical farms to the existing agricultural land, just in, in theory, I think it was a 15 story, you would produce enough food for 34 trillion people. Now people say, well, you know, we can't, obviously you have different regional things and, and irrigation and so on, that, but yeah, but it makes moot when you look at that type of number of potential. And the reduction of energy, basically vertical farms allow for a extreme reduction in the need for fertilizer, the need for light and energy, and the need for water. And the, the study, the, the examples of this that exist in different places, granted, you're producing, uh, you're obviously not producing meat. I mean, and, and in truth, human society has to get away from, from animal agriculture anyway, if it expects to be sustainable. And, you have an incredible potential for abundance. And you put these in localized areas. You know, in New York, they've been converting some warehouses to start doing this. Very, very small amounts of investment is slowly being put into this, but it needs to be amplified rapidly because with the loss of topsoil, with 70% of our freshwater going to agriculture in the midst of what is effectively a, a water crisis, by, 20, by 2030, I think it was, the stat was 60% of the world would be in a water-stressed area. Uh, it, it, there's nothing positive in those trends at all. So that's one great potential way to not only feed local populations well, but also to remove uh, the incredible ecological footprint that agriculture is doing today. Automation is also used constantly uh, as a talking point against the rise in labor standards, right? Against wage increases, because it will take away these skilled jobs. We saw this in the 80s with, with car manufacturers. We see it today with restaurants, uh, fast food industry, um, stores, right, CVS, et cetera. You encourage automation because you say that it will liberate people. How? Well, it, <clears throat> there's a few levels to it. First, what has been the greatest source of oppression on this planet since recorded history? Labor. Yeah. So not only do, is, it, is it irresponsible for us not to apply automation because it's more efficient, it's safer, we can create more of an abundance with, more, you know, with less resources, um, it's also a dra dramatic shift in the way human relations has been. So if we can finally remove that ownership, labor, that old classist duality with the use of automation, that would be profound just on that level. 
I mean, you, if you, you know, people say th silly things too, like, well, if you increase in abundance, uh, we'll have just have overpopulation. People will keep reproducing. It's actually the opposite now. That was the case at the end of the Malthusian trap. We had a huge burst of, pop of um, huge burst of population when we found, you know, hydrocarbons and then the technology boomed. But when you look at stats now in countries that have overpopulation, they're poor countries. And when you have countries that actually have decent affluency, they, they're not reproducing rapidly anymore. So if you want to stop what people perceive as a apparent overpopulation, which is a dubious word because it's not quantifiably viable, you know, there isn't, there's only overpopulation in our society because our society is so inefficient. It's not overpopulation uh, because you know, suddenly we're at ma outdoing the resources of the planet. Um, but if you create an uh, equitable playing field and you meet people's needs, the population issue will not be an issue. It would completely create it. I can't even emphasize enough what it would do to the psychology of people to be free of that drudgery and that sense of exploitation of each other. How does intellectual property prove to be one of the biggest flaws of this system? I, the main reason is that intellectual property restricts the open flow naturally and it allows, it restricts people's contribution to given ideas. So intellectual property, the whole of industry is pushed by sharing one way or another. So some cell phone company makes something, they invent some kind of proprietary something or another. Another cell phone, they release it under, you know, all spices of old secrecy. Then finally another cell phone company experiences that, it imitates it, and suddenly the little competitive war that people call innovation continues. Extremely wasteful and completely unnecessary. So why not just open source all intellectual property across the entire sector, if not across business in general? You would see exponential increase in efficiency. If I could sit back and, and, and design my own camera, along with millions of others in an open source community, a collaborative commons, you would see the efficiency of that given technology far transcend what uh, any given boardroom or any even small group of technicians could ever come up with. That's the wisdom of crowds. And that, that's happening, like that's what drives our industry in the long run but it does it in such a slow way because we're not sharing it directly. So you want to you want to see a dramatic uh, innovation in this world then drop capitalism because it's it's inhibiting innovation more than it is anything else especially now. Yeah, completely inhibiting the medical field as well just all these patents oh, on, on medicine it's disgusting. Well, I mean think about the the people that wanted to make generics. I did document this in the book as well. There were people suffering from tuberculosis and HIV related diseases and they were looking for they were looking to make their own generics and the western pharmaceutical industry including all the way up to the White House said nope. Intellectual property restricts you from producing this. You have to buy it from us. And finally, they gave them like a, you know, a little bit of a discount. <laughs> Only they hundreds of dollars, not thousands per pill, yeah. per cancer pill. No, the, and, and you bring up a good point. The medical industry and it's, is the best example of artificial scarcity. The idea that these pills cost. You know, I have a family member that had cancer and they gave her this little thing and they stuck it on her arm. And it was $17,000 for this little piece of plastic that simply injected the fluid in, into her. $17,000. There's no way. You're paying um, for yachts. Yeah, You're not paying there, for plastic. This is made by a machine in some pharmaceutical company in about five minutes with chemicals that are being mixed that are far from rare or scarce. It'd be different if they had to go all the way to Amazon and find <laughs> something. And, you know, no, it's, it's the biggest fraud industry out there. I, I think another fraudulent uh, fundamental basis of, of the whole system is competition because you know, we're all ingrained with the notion that all these technological advancements come from competition incentivizing, of course, the development of these ideas. You discuss the need to move from competitive to collaborative. Yeah. Why is competition not all it's made out to be? The first problem with competition in a market system where everyone's competing for market share, meaning money, there, the competition becomes, the innovation that's produced is artificial. It, they're not trying to improve on something to meet a human need. They're trying to improve on something to sell. A healthy uh, uh, industrial system isn't trying to artificially create demand once again. It's there to meet demand. In fact, you don't want to artificially create demand because that means you're going to be reducing your sustainability. You want a minimalistic culture. You don't want what advertising is driving now. So that's an aside of what you're asking, but I think it's a very important point that people miss when they talk about innovation uh, through competition especially. So competition has been proven in many academic journals to be hideously hindering and neur neuroses producing. There's little evidence to say that the competitive industry of, of capitalism actually innovates in a way that's somehow superior to a collaborative system, especially if people have the same intent. So you can imagine, you know, anyone can sit and imagine the building of something, once again, in like an open source collaborative commons, and they know what they want. They can, they can infer what the next stage would be. It doesn't take this sort of 
imposition built on the comp com competitive coercion effectively to impose the demand upon them. So if we know what we want and we can infer the next stage of things, why do we need companies competing against each other? We can just, now we have the technology to work together. And again, it's, it would be that much more innovative if we did that. Yeah, no, I mean, when you look at just even your childhood development, I mean, in school, people are incentivized to cheat, yeah. to get ahead. And, and there's always going to be way more losers. And what does that do to the psychology of, oh, yeah. of humanity? The general competitive neuroses and fetish. It reinforces, once again, the in-group, out-group, underlying uh, hierarchy-enhancing tendency. Because if you have a society that believes in this type of competitive ethic, if you have a society that, that says winners and losers are a part of this system and I want to be a winner, then suddenly you can justify walking over homeless people in the street. You can justify the bombing of this or that country. You can justify just about anything that hurts another human being under the guise that it's just the competitive nature of our world. Our whole system today is based on, on the idea of scarcity, but the opposite, of course, is true, where we have an overabundance, as, as you're explaining so clearly. Talk about how the development and stages of market capitalism got us to where we are today. There's a, a geographical determinism that isn't talked about enough. When people talk about markets and capitalism, they tend to go back to Adam Smith and say, well, some you know, theorists got together and realized that we should have specialized labor and so on. That's not how it happened at all. Uh, you go back to the Agrarian Revolution 10, 12,000 years ago, and once, it, once people decided it was more efficient for themselves to start to settle and create farms and the slight scientific advancement that happened with tools, suddenly you had all the, the prerequisites for things like property and protection, labor specialization and trade. And within trade, trade strategizing dominance. And that's the core characteristic in the book. I refer to it as the root socioeconomic orientation of our society, which again is based on that scarcity. And it's also based on competition. And it's based on trade strategizing dominance, which leads to oppression and deprivation and so on as a, as a competitive outcome. So the Neolithic Revolution happened, and suddenly society started to build in these structures with all of those things into it. So there hasn't been much of a shift. There have been pockets of people that have lived differently, Aboriginal cultures, Native American cultures. So the geographical determinism has to be taken into account. And you see the force of this dominant kind of desert-based culture and then the, the stratified societies taking hold and slowly eradicating all the other groups trying to live a little bit differently. And suddenly it's manifested as we have today with uh, trade strategizing dominance as the virtue of our, our existence, the need to compete and win, and of course the development of countries, borders, and empires. Empires, if it wasn't the United States, in this type of climate it would have been someone else because it's simply the most efficient state for any group dominance to maintain as much total global dominance as they can. You have to break it, and the only way to break it is to start with root changes in what started all of this, which is effectively the economic perception, your perception of your, the perception of your survival and your group. And you, if you change that, then you'll be able to slowly morph society back into what was really a pre-Neolithic kind of worldview, which was all based on community, gift giving. Uh, if you look, 99% of human society existed without money in markets. A lot of people forget that too. So this isn't some inevitability the way we live. What is the silver bullet that can possibly transform this negative trajectory that we're on? And that is structural change of the economy. Morality is not going to do it. Our free will is not going to do it. Our rational sense is not going to do it in and of itself because we are so inhibited and dominated by the structural psychology generated from our social system. And reforms aren't going to do it either, which is one of the main points of your book is that 21st century activism has been far too localized. Yeah. I, I, I don't like to be one to criticize all the well-meaning people in the activist community, but I think it's a constructive conversation to say if we don't, if we don't focus on the root and we keep sparsely drawing attention in this or that protest or this or that activist initiative to certain pockets of effectively problems, it just ends up running in place. The activist initiatives that are required now have to grasp that and realize that now it's time for galvanization towards removing the foundation of our social system and hence the market. We have to really start to move, move away from market economics as rapidly as we possibly can to save our ecology and to save the stability of our society in terms of group relationships. The antagonism that's created with our class system builds into all the other antagonisms we see, whether it's, whether it's gender, whether it's race, whether it's nationalistic. So it, it's like that central kernel that keeps amplifying the worst of our group, our anti-group uh, associations. How do we socialize and localize the enterprise, and who is standing in the way of this being done? I mean, obviously, the, the forefront of it are the, are the, the ownership class, as historically called. 
the power structure is defined by the ownership class. And then going back to the state, the state has always been comprised of the heavy business interests of any given society, heavy economic interests, even before business was a thing, so to speak. And who, who do, what, what incentive do they have to want to alter their position? That's why it's going to take a galvanized force of activists that is, the world probably has never seen in order to overcome this hurdle. And I don't, I'm not you know, promoting any kind of violence or anything, but there has to be something that stops this thing in its tracks uh, before the ecological. The ecological crisis, if it is allowed to materialize in the way the trajectories show between climate change, between uh, the water scarcity, between all the other levels of pollution that, that are coming to fruition, the incredible amount of waste, you know, more plastic in the ocean by 2050, more plastic than fish in the ocean by 2050. Good God. Uh, the general destruction of the oceans, you know, overall because of various factors that are happening. Um, if this is allowed to materialize, and this is why I argue at the end of the book, it will just create that much more class antagonism and make it that much more difficult for us to pull out of, of this horrible uh, in-group, out-group phenomenon and the oppression that we see. So there's a time limit ticking down because if things start getting literally scarce, remember the first, the first and second world war were dominance wars. They weren't based on scarcity. The kind of wars in the future, if scarcity hits like it, it's going to, if we don't change, is they're going to be cataclysmic. But we, the human society hasn't seen that yet, hasn't seen an actual resource war, not a real one, not when water is now limited and people are going to go to war over it. And it's ridiculous to even think that that would happen frankly, because we have all the technology to resolve it. But the arrogance of the people that are in power and the, the myopic view of the business community is such that, again, they blinker these things out in favor of the general structure, and they're willing to forego the well-being of others uh, in euphemistically uh, in order uh, to preserve their positions. So no more respect needs to be placed on the billionaires of this world or the political establishment. I'm not saying that people should be just arbitrarily ridiculed, but we have to break the cultural violence, this need, this incessant impulsive thing that's happened in society where we worship class and status and billionaires. And it hasn't gotten better. <laughs> it has, it's gotten much worse, as again, I think the Trump, sig Trump, Trump's election signifies. And we can't, we should loathe people. Anyone that's a billionaire that doesn't say, I'm sorry, I'm a billionaire, but I'm gonna do my best, that's someone you would respect. Anyone that doesn't question the fact that that doesn't raise the issue that it's wrong for it even to be possible that a billionaire can exist in this planet. It's just as it's wrong that someone should be sleeping on the street in their life. If that isn't pointed out, then the, neur the neuroses uh, will continue. It certainly is not gonna last, and, and your book is incredible. Again, everyone check it out, The New Human Rights Movement. The end vision for this book is a beautifully democratized symbiotic ecosystem almost, where people are collaboratively growing society. Yeah. Talk about how, how you lay that vision out. Well, in terms of transition, there are five steps. So I try to be as, as direct as I can because it's very easy to just bring up theory. So the five steps are the application of automation that we've talked about, the access of things as opposed to property, which doesn't necessarily mean that suddenly no property exists. It means that the society is incentivized to share what it has. Then there's open source, which builds into the access phenomenon. Open source is what will create the innovation. Then there's the localization phenomenon. That's, that's where we finally realize we keep a global sense, but we realize we don't need to have all of this industry spread all over the world in order to satisfy a community on the other side of the world. You know what I mean? So that's that one. And then the other one is this more difficult thing to bring up called digitized network feedback, which all that really means you track all the transactions that are happening, economic transactions, and it can be within a monetary system or without, and you have all the feedback that you need to know what's happening in an industry. So you put all these together, and you end up with a system that incentivizes people working together, incentivizes people sharing, all those kindergarten things that we're taught, remember? All those things that we're supposed to have in our values that are completely robbed of us uh, as we grow older and we realize that all the things we were taught as children is that our ideal values were apparently wrong, because no one ascribed to them anymore. And you have a non-competitive society, obviously, and you have a society that's actually sustainability focused because we're understanding what we're doing. So the, it creates peaceful coexistence, more peaceful coexistence, and peaceful coexistence with nature, meaning we're not over-exploiting. And the only caveat to that, and I wanna bring this back up because this isn't a totally deterministic, mechanistic, mechanistic view, is that we have to have a mature culture that doesn't thrive on this over-consuming, materialistic, vain, uh, uh, idealism. That is the great, uh, that's the great argument I hear from people. But you know, this, I envision a world where people are actually able to 
to get what they need and it becomes a social reality as opposed to a material and vindictive and status-based reality. It doesn't mean that hierarchy doesn't exist in the future or in an idealized society because there are other things that we do. I'm not a visual artist, you're a visual artist. I'm a musician. There are natural hierarchies that happen and we respect those hierarchies because we appreciate the talents of people, not because they're they have more money than you, therefore you're supposed to glamorize them and look up to them as though they're better than you. That is a complete contrivance. So there's always going to be a natural hierarchy, which is good, because that proves our group mind, it proves our collaborative sense that you can do things that I can't do, and so on and so forth. That's what motivates the collaborative sense and the power of our society as a civilization. And if we can bring those form that formula together, we could get everything back on track.